And now, our continued interview with Mr. David Morell. Did you have any uh, students that went on to um, full-time writing careers that you know of? Yes, I had one student named uh, uh, Boyle, B-O-Y-L-E, uh, Tom, Tom Corregasson Boyle, T.C. Boyle, okay. uh, multiple award winner, uh, absolute uh, brilliant writer. He was a student of mine. I didn't teach him writing, but I, I, I got him to graduate because he and I talked a lot and he, you know, he, he came in and he said, I'm one credit short. They're not going to let me graduate. <coughs> And I, 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 he said, what can I do? I said, all right, you know, is there any, are there any books that you ever wanted to read that you haven't had a chance to read? And he had, I said, give me the list and you can do a one credit course for me where you read these books because you would anyhow, and then write me a one page reaction to each book. Oh. So, so and he, mow my lawn. <laughs> and, yeah, nah, I, Tom is a great guy. He, he, he just did absolutely terrific. When in the week magazine, uh, which is a really cool magazine, it sort of compresses a lot of all kinds of cultural things. And, uh, when they asked him about his five books, you know, if you were recommending, he put first blood on. Oh, wow. uh, so I thought that was, that was good. But, uh, another of my students, um, um, went on to be, a the uh, head of a major uh, publishing company uh, in Oof. New York. And, you know, another went on to do a lot of work in the, uh, behind the scenes in the Today Show and things like that. Oddly, I never hear from them. Uh, I mean, a few of them I saw again later in life, but, uh, you know, with thousands of students over the years, hmm. um, almost never. It may be they just feel, you know, it isn't their place, but, uh, you know, it's always fun to, to learn what, what happened to people. Absolutely. That's so neat. Um, going back to what we had kind of talked about earlier, we talked about your Western and talked about uh, John Wayne. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what you're writing, what you're doing with that? and um, With the Western? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can't say a word. Can't okay. say a word? They'll steal it. Uh oh. Okay. They'll what? steal it. No, I, I figured out how to do a novel that encapsulates, a Western that encapsulates all Westerns. And I, I, I can't, I just can't say how I'm doing it. <sighs> Smart man. There you go. See. And, and in, in the book, I'll say this, all, most of the characters are named after Western icons, directors and writers, most. Hmm. So, you know, it's kind of a, it's my inside joke, you know, at the end, I'm going to have a list of all the illusions you know because <laughs> you know, there's a there's in one there's a there's a a, a walk-on character his name is roy whitney well uh roy rogers uh who's an interest of mine because um people generally well i guess not so much anymore you know roy rogers um what they don't know is that uh he was blacklisted in 1951 uh only 13 years into his career and his career it basically was from 38 to 51, and he never made another studio film because he he uh, was in a lawsuit arguing that actors should have a right from the proceeds of sales to television. And he was, you know, that was the end. And basically from then on, he did have a briefly a television series. And, you know, 80 million people, half the population of the United States went to his movies. And wow. all of a sudden they didn't exist. Yeah. Me, um, e except for you know uh the tv and some guest stars and you know some 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 concerts he did but the career was you know prematurely ended but anyhow that my riff on roy i'll stop that but he was really really important and and his movies out of spite the studio mutilated his movies mm. so they cut them all somewhere as long as 79 minutes they cut them all to 54 minutes wow and they took the black, the color, and they made them black and white. I mean, you know, they they did everything but piss on them. Mm -hmm. And and uh, so until recently, no one had seen a true Roy Rogers film. Wow. Only recently has there have a couple of remastered ones shown up. So I thought, all right, we'll do Roy Rogers. But the best ones, the Roy Rogers movies that were the best and incredibly violent, except you wouldn't see them in the 54 version, 
54 minute versions were directed by a man named William Whitney. Hmm. So Roy Whitney walks on and, and does some stuff. <laughs> Only if you're really deep into the cosmos of Westerns would you know. But I'll put it at the end and, you know, it'll be fun. But, or now you watch this podcast. I mean, I mean, how violent were these Roy Rogers movies? What would you think if in, the, in a cowboy movie in 1950, 51, that Roy and the bad guy take out bull whips and they whip each other until their shirts are off and they have blood all over their, their skin. Really? Yeah. Jeez. So, so my the mother, bunch. My yeah, mother well, there it is. <laughs> Your mother? Yeah, she's a huge, and like, when I go visit her house, there's, there's stuff on the walls. All well, just here, joy. go to Kino Lorber, you know, the, the, uh, the, the DVD people, Kino Lorber, you know, have you heard of them? No, it's, a, no. it's a brand. It's like, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's like Simon and Schuster. It's a okay. group that okay. releases. And they have a website, Kino Lorber, K-I-N-O-O-L-R-B-E-R. And if you go there, look for a movie called Trigger Jr. And Trigger Jr. is in color, beautiful color, uh, and it's full length. And uh, in, in this one, uh, Trigger gets blinded. A, a killer horse kicks uh, Trigger in the head. And Trigger is blind through most of the film. Uh, and a lot of the film has a, 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 is for shot from Trigger's viewpoint. <laughs> Hmm. through the blur looking oh, at wow. some of the action scenes you know wow. and then the big thing is at the end <laughs> i can't imagine they showed this on tv at the end the, the head bad guy who's in charge of the killer horse and roy's beating him up and the maniacal killer horse shows up and we figure well royal let the horse stop the bad guy right <laughs> wouldn't that be right yeah. but roy doesn't do that he turns around and shoots the horse dead Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, my God. There's a twist. <laughs> <laughs> what? You know, so anyway. They mess trigger, with Trigger. And, <laughs> and you, would, you would love it uh, if you, you get this for her. And then and they have sales. It's like eight ninety five dollars Blu-ray, uh, oh, wow. sometimes a little bit more. But you get that for her and visit her and put it on and watch it with her. And you will both really have a good time. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it starts off sort of, you know, light for the kids. Because the thing is that the, the, uh, the, the soldiers that come back from the war and, you know, the, the stuff before the war wasn't going to do it anymore because they'd seen the right. real thing. Yeah. So what you needed was, you know, upping the ante of the action. So um, the first third would be for the kids. And then gradually it would get darker. These movies got darker in the second act. And by the third, you didn't act. You didn't know what the hell was going to happen. I mean, you know, it, these were crazy films, you know, with blind trigger and Roy shooting the phantom horse and all this. Wow. So I think you'd have some fun. But anyhow, the, um, and, you know, the re it's readily found. I, honestly, you, you have a great time if you watch this film. With I am, I'm going to take your advice and do yeah. that, and I will report back. I, I, I wish you would. <laughs> you know, I, I tried to do, I wrote and tried to produce a, a documentary about Roy um, because um, he, his real name was Leonard Sly, and he was by the studio given the name Roy Rogers and in the second act of his career they decided to make him play a guy named Roy Rogers in the movies <laughs> so now you had a guy who was Leonard Sly who was named Roy Rogers who was playing Roy, playing Rogers, Roy Rogers in the film who decided to try in real life to become the kind of man that Roy Rogers on the screen was now this is once upon a time that's in made it. I was just going to say that's just like yeah and if when you see you say you saw uh, sounds like the national anthem. You say you saw. Um, it, oh, say you see. Um, the you say you saw. <laughs> once upon a time in Hollywood last night, right? Yes. So in Rick Dalton's apartment, and for me, Rick Dalton is as real as uh, DiCaprio. In Rick Dalton's apartment, the whole wall has a poster for the Golden Stallion, yeah. a Roy Rogers film by William Whitney. William Whitney is one of Quentin Tarantino's favorite directors. And whenever come, somebody comes to the house and says, let me see a film by one of your directors, he shows another one called The, the Golden Stallion. Huh. And, and in that one, uh, 
they're going to kill trigger uh, for for doing for you know uh, knocking somebody a bad guy's head and Roy says no no I killed the guy because they he can't have trigger killed so he goes to prison and works on a chain gang <laughs> in order to have saved his horse and, <laughs> and then what and what Quentin says is he says now in one of my films Roy would come out ready to kill everybody in the world yeah. <laughs> But Roy has such common decency that he fights that in order to do the righteous thing. And uh, if you're curious, uh, you can Google Quentin Tarantino and Roy Rogers. And there's a New York Times article about him talking, a long article about him talking about Roy Rogers. No, well, I've got a lot of things to do this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> you just see all the notes. I'm I'm, it's, like, it's like dry rot. You know, it just no. gets <laughs> so, so, um, Going back to uh, First Blood, there's yeah. a part where Colonel uh, Troutman is talking uh, about searching for Rambo, mm. and he references technology that was at the time new, and he says, this is the last of something. It's too bad. Oh, yeah. Is, yeah, yeah. Which is a hate war. So um, in my novel, it, it's called Drone Kings. Okay. And it made me realize how prescient you were in 1972. And when you're writing these lines, what kind of machines did you envision? Um. I, I'm trying to remember, probably because you know in Vietnam they did infer they did um, uh, heat seeking. They had heat seeking uh, equipment, yeah. So they could fly over. Uh, and be very, very, you know, not very sophisticated compared to what we have today. Right. Uh, but uh, they could tell where, uh, say, a you know an enemy group would be and things like that. So I don't remember the specific. Um, uh, you know, that passage or the specific element, but clearly I'm echoing the wild bunch. Hmm. Huh. Uh, and I'm, I'm echoing Sam Peckinpah's great theme of the ending of something and the beginning of something else and, you know, how you relate to change. So, um, you know, I'm just, I just have to assume that that's what I was doing because Peckinpah, like, you know, as a filmmaker, like, and Tarantino, um, you know, just occupies my creative, you know, impulses. The line in that passage that Chris and I were discussing that, that stood out to us was it, it ends with something about, I fear the day when machines will take the place of men. Well, there you are. You know, and, and I and thought that was fascinating given what's going on today. With with, all the drones and what have you. Absolutely. Yep. You know, and it's not going to get, you know, that's where we're headed. And, uh, you know, everything's an adjustment. Hmm. Now I want to know what you think 20 years from now. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm managing to hang in pretty good. So I have a feeling that, you know, maybe I'll be around. Yeah. That's so. <laughs> yep. So speaking of staying with the Rambo character, um, I read an anecdote about your experience in Poland when you went and, and you had, full days of signing and it was just a, a tr tremendous response and you were kind of confused yes. by why you were such and but can you kind of relate that story as to why what rambo meant to poland well it's um again this is an example about how you know we do our best and sometimes there's an influence that we're not aware of um the it was pretty wild in poland this was in 2001 and uh i had journalists who wanted to talk to me for couple of days in a row and and the publisher was putting in 15 minute interviews and i thought this is not this is not right uh i mean to give you an example a former president clinton showed up in poland at the same time and i had the presidential suite and he had the author's suite <laughs> So why was this? Because <laughs> the Secret Service didn't do a good advance. <laughs> uh, and, and he was over here on a sidebar, and I was up here on That's the awesome. front page. So why was this? So the answer is that um, a female journalist who was around 30, and that's important for 2001, uh, as you'll see, she said, uh, you're puzzled, aren't you? And their English is you know, better than my Polish. And, and even though my wife is Polish, uh, I can say Jen Kuya, which is thank you, I think. 
Um, <laughs> and uh, anyhow, she said, yeah, you're, you're puzzled. So let me tell you a story. She said, during the solidarity years, 89, 90, um, the Rambo films were illegal in Poland, but they were smuggled in in VHS form. Right. And demonstrators watched them and put on the bandana and went out and demonstrated against the Soviets. Wow. And Holy she God. said, I know because I was in those groups. She mm. would have been, what, 1918 mm. uh, years of age. And she said, so you can say that in an indirect way, Rambo helped bring down the Soviet Union. <laughs> mm. And when the, when the wall came down, when the Berlin Wall, uh, famously, there was a Rambo had been written across the wall, too. So you never know, you know, what will happen. And that's one reason why I was so bitter about the new movie, because it, you know, it had no nobility to it. Mm. Uh, and, um, but, you know, uh, can't undo it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it was, uh, it was a powerful uh, you, you just never know how things will, you know, move and influence. Right. I would imagine that was, there were some chills on you, on your arm when, when you. Oh, absolutely. I, my jaw dropped. I mean, <clears throat> you know, uh, how can you, how can you relate to a thought like that? Uh, and how, how would, um, you know, when I think about how, when I was starting the novel and, and I, I don't know if you guys know the story about the name, where the name came from. I do. <laughs> uh, uh, how about the rest of you? If not, I'll, I'll tell it. Yeah, so. uh, let's, let's hear it again. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we, my wife, uh, I've been married for, I, I don't know, 55 years and uh, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, but my wife, you know, uh, at the time, um, still the same wife. It sounds like it's another one. Um, but she and she and our daughter had gone out and we didn't have a lot of money, but she, I think she had 25 cents. This is my wife. And she bought some apples because that's what she could afford to buy. Hmm. And so she comes home with the apples. And I remember vividly, it's a Saturday afternoon and we had two rooms. We had a living room kitchen in graduate housing and we had a bedroom. And I was, um, we had a little table in the bedroom and my typewriter was there and, and our daughter's crib was there. And, and, you know, I'm writing my great American novel and my wife comes in and says, I bought these great, great tasting apples, you know, have a taste of the apple. And I'm saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, later type, 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 type. And you know, the manuscript looked weird because I didn't have a name. So, you know, I'd have, Blank, 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 runs through the forest, you know. So, I mean, there were all these blank spaces on the, because I didn't mm -hmm. have the name of the character. And uh, she says, no, really, I think you should, and I just love this, the, 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 the mythology here. I think you should bite into this apple. So, all right, crunch, you know, tastes pretty good. So, I'm trying to, you know go away. It tastes pretty good. And, you know, inevitably, when you say that, the next thing you say is, what's it called? <laughs> and the answer is, it's a Rambo apple. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what? And she said, a Rambo apple. And I said, spell it. And she said, R-A-M-B-O. And I said, Okay. Uh, now, here's the story. In, in Pennsylvania, rapple, Rambo apples are common. That's, that's the kind of apple they would serve at the Nittany Lion Inn for visiting people, uh, you know, for at the university. That's what they have is Rambo apples. But I, I wasn't aware of it. And when Johnny Appleseed, John Chapman, went through Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Indiana, planting apple trees they were rambo apple trees uh so you know the whole thing is just too cool but you have to be aware you know people some people say oh well an apple yeah but hey would you have been smart enough to yeah. recognize what the heck it was you know right. and i i just leapt on i said oh my god you know and you do you know as i as i as you guys know you know a lot of writing is just paying attention 
you know, the ideas yeah. are flowing around this and all you have to do is ask the right questions and ta-da, you know, you've got it. Yeah. Sometimes See, if that was my wife, she, if that was my wife to this day, she'd say, Oh, remember when I helped you uh, write that? She iconic- does. <laughs> <laughs> she does. You know, she wants a new couch. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, no. She's as cheap as I am. You know? <laughs> we still don't spend anything, you know, but. That's um, yeah, awesome. As long as you're happy. Yeah. Well, David, David, you have survived the first round the first round of the crew reviews, we have what's called the lightning round. Oh, okay. In the show with, and um, what that is, is as I like to say, all of our, we all grew up with mother saying, think before you speak, always mm-hmm. think before you speak. And this is the portion of the show where we encourage you to speak before you think. Oh, I don't <laughs> think so. No, you know, <laughs> keep looking at this. This I'm trying to, let's see if we can get the light better. Finally, at the end of the show, we'll get the light better. Get a little bit better. Okay. So I'm going to ask. No, I'm avoiding the issue. Oh, okay. We're going to each ask you five questions and, and we kind of joke about that. They're, they're, they're varying levels of absurdity. Okay. Um, but to kind of get outside the, the mainstream of, of normal questioning. Yes. Yeah. I will go first. All right. If first question, if you had to live in another century than the ones you've lived in, yes, which would it be, and where in the world would it be? Oh, I would definitely love to have met Thomas De Quincey at, at eighteen. You know, because I feel so at home in eighteen fifty four London. I, you know, we went over to uh, England on a research trip, and I didn't need the current maps in my memory of the map that I was using <clears> in the <throat> book. I could get around London on that from eighteen fifty one. Definitely, mind you, the health. It was a terrible time, you know, mm-hmm. and the, the. I mean, it was it was you know it was filthy and it had uh you know the the air and what have you i mean you wouldn't want to live there but uh you know maybe for a weekend mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay question number two i knock on your door and your wife answers and says yes. he's at his favorite spot in santa fe yes where do i find david morrell in my office in your <laughs> <laughs> so you're home <laughs> that sounds yeah, to me yeah. like a man who doesn't want to give up his favorite spot in Santa Fe. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't, we don't go out much. Uh, we have, you know, some good friends. I have a Western watching group and once a month we get together and we watch two Westerns and we go to you know, our houses and all that. And there are a couple of, you know, some restaurants we like in town and, you know, there's some theaters here that I like and certainly the opera. We have a world-class opera. The opera is um, outstanding. And, uh, you know, we, we get around, but, you know, in mm. truth, there, there might be a couple of weeks where I never leave the house. Mm. Nothing wrong with that. If you got Nothing the right. Wrong. Okay. My third question, we've actually kind of brushed up against this. You have to name another character after another variety of apple. <laughs> what is the character's name? <laughs> I guess it would be Macintosh. Don't do it. Macintosh. There you go. <laughs> I That's have two a- apple trees outside my office and they're, they're grafted with five different kinds of apples in each tree. So Oof. future characters, <laughs> golden delicious, I guess wouldn't work. Don't do it. Golden delicious. I, I do it. <laughs> Granny Smith, put the knife down. Yeah, there. Hey, that's good. I, that'll work. Question uh, four is going to be the hardest one I ask you. <clears throat> Saul, Drew, Rambo and Kavanaugh are yeah. locked in a warehouse to do battle. Uh-huh. Who exits the warehouse? Well, if it's in the dark, it'll be Drew. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, this is, this is another one of my, my, my peeves. Um, people, um, you know, they just, they work in a genre, but they don't know the history. And mm-hmm. for, um, I did a, 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 in the Fraternity of the Stone, which is maybe my favorite book, um, in the Fraternity, apart from Murders of Fine Art, the, the, there's a, a Drew McLean has been trained to fight in the dark mm-hmm. uh, and, and all using with no sight to absorb all the other four senses. And he's chasing a man at night and they go down steps into the basement of a building and they go through a room into another room. And as the doors close, they are totally in the dark. And the next scene lasts 20 pages as Drew tries to assess using his other senses what kind of room it is what would be in the room and where this guy would be and so we have a fight in a totally dark room and uh i just you know i had no idea that was a 20 page scene because in my head i i can visualize that scene right now and i did not know it was that that's amazing 
And, and you know, a couple of years ago, I was at, at a conference where they were talking about fights in books. And these people knew they were going to be in a panel months ahead of time about fights in books. And they had, they, they had nothing. They had nothing to talk about. And, you know, I mean, it wouldn't have taken a whole lot of research, at least to find that fight, yeah. you know, as a, as a, you know, a place that was different. It's one of my favorites. All right. My last question, probably an easy one for you. Like, I think I know your answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. The best margarita in New Mexico is served where? Well, I haven't had a margarita in years, but the best margarita I had in memory was at the Mine Shaft Tavern in a place called Madrid. Madrid. In, uh, I gave up, I lost my taste for alcohol two years ago. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I've no, no problem with alcohol. I love drinking, but it kept making my face red. And mm -hmm. then it, you know, and it was doing, a, and I realized I had an allergy to it. So I haven't had any alcohol in what, two years. Wow. Um, never think about it. Uh, so, you know, um, so now I'm relying on my memory, but certainly that Madrid Margarita at the Mine Shaft Tavern. Quick story about that. My wife and I lived in Albuquerque at that time. And we drove up to Santa Fe and we took the back road. I forget what the route's called, but you'd know. And, yeah. um, and the we, Turquoise Trail. Yes. And we came through Madrid and I had just read that book. Okay. And, and you so stopped we, in. We stopped yeah. there and I had, a, and it was a damn good margarita. Yeah. Yeah, but that, that town is really cool. That's a. They a had, they have their own film festival now and they have a Christmas thing. It was a hippie. The mine went, went south and then all the hippies in the sixties moved in. And, uh, and, and then now it's sort of, you know, become more yuppified. You know? Which reminds me of the movie last night. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Similar, similar vibe. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Eric. Okay. I think I'm up. Um, so David, you've met quite a few scribes in your days, you spent yes. a lot of time with writers. Um, is there anyone in particular that you would like to just, that you've met that you haven't really spent good quality time with maybe you've only met in passing is there someone you'd like to actually sit down and have a meal with spend a, spend oh, a long that, time that is hard uh, um gosh you know nobody it doesn't come to mind um uh, and of course as soon as i you know yeah. walk away i'll say <laughs> you know i should um but it you, I, i'm gonna have to draw a blank on that you, you could that. say sean cameron and he'll be ah, totally consent go. with that well sean of course <laughs> there we are you know there you go. <laughs> edit, the, edit the part where Eric tells him to say that out. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Easy enough. That's great. That's good. Mike will take care of that for you. Yep. Um, okay. So my second question, someone, me, I'm going to say right now the word national anthem. What comes to mind first, Canadian or American? Probably the American anthem. Okay. Um, uh, it, you know, I left Canada when I was 22. So I've lived in the United States a lot, you know, right. longer and proportionally. Yeah. So I would, I would say the Canadian anthem, or I'm sorry, yeah. the American anthem. Okay. <clears throat> I have so dual I citizenship just for in case anybody's um, uh, curious. Um, and, and, and I think my work in some ways incorporates that, you know, that combination. Hmm. So slightly impossible, but since we're having crazy questions, we can ask this. So you're flying across the Pacific to a conference out in Asia and you have yeah. all of your books with you. Right. The plane crashes. The good news is you live. <laughs> yeah. The bad news is. All I've got to read is one of my books. Only three books survive. Oh my God. What yes. three books do you want to survive that crash? You get. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've mentioned the titles before, probably, I, you know, First Blood and it would have to be either Brotherhood of the Rose or Fraternity of the Stone. Either of those, those books is really special. And, and, you know, any of the, any of the, Murder is a fine art, probably from the because it was the first from the from the trilogy. Although I was told not to use the word trilogy, it sounds like making readers work. You're supposed to say <laughs> three part series. Oh, very good. Okay, so my fourth question: Finish this sentence for me. Unsigned authors need to do what? Ah, uh, you mean like unsigned at a at yeah. a. You haven't haven't landed an agent yet. So if you have oh, not landed an agent, go, you go to literary conferences. Uh, I came up when there weren't any conferences, right. Right. Um, and I, you know, mine was a struggle. But these days, <clears throat> almost every 
a respectable conference has an agent section where you get to, you know, meet agents and talk to them and get a sense of, uh, you know, what, uh, what they're looking for and what you can provide, you know, but oddly I, I said that wrong because often, you know, when you think about the breakout books, um, they're not anything that anybody was looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, those are ones that somebody said, Oh my God, why hasn't this been done before? And, you know, and that's, that's how, how trends start. So, but I, I definitely go to writers conferences and I have some mantras, be a first rate version of yourself, not a second rate version of another writer. Mm -hmm. And, and the other one is don't chase the market because you'll always see its backside. Um, which I think you've got some of those good mantras Oh right yeah, in 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 uh, in, uh successful novelist. Thank you. Absolutely. It's um, not my title. I hated that title, but the publisher <laughs> said we've got to have that title. See, for me, I I think of that book as lessons from a lifetime of writing because yeah. that's the first title I saw. Yeah. yeah, that that's what I think of. But you know, the it 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 just became a marketing decision. So uh, there we were. So, so you've already said so my final question again, on the silly side, but you've already said the possessions and that kind of stuff doesn't, isn't necessarily that important, but uh, Sly Sloan calls and says, David, I want to buy you a car, any car uh, you want. Yeah. What car would you like him to buy you? Well, um, I own a Porsche. Uh, I have a 1995 Porsche uh, and I'm very partial to the cars. Uh, if my Porsche broke apart tomorrow, I would buy another one, but I would not buy a new one because hmm. they're too fancy. Uh, mine is an air cooled engine. And so I would look for something that was up to maybe 97 when, you know, they moved into the other thing, but I'm very, this goes back to, you know, I have a thing about Steve McQueen, a nasty guy, but a brilliant, uh, brilliant film actor. Oh yeah. And, um, uh, McQueen did a not very good because there's no story film called mm -hmm. Le Mans about race car driving. The race car stuff's good. It's just, there's no story. And, um, in it, he drives a Porsche and I'd never seen one before. And I, you know, I just became imprinted. So that, you know, that became the car that I always uh, wanted. And the, the, the story is I, uh, we mentioned extreme denial, um, I sold extreme denial to Michael Douglas and I didn't option it he bought it and he bought big hmm. and then i was hired to do the screenplay and then i was fired <laughs> oh. because because <laughs> michael had a this is what i was told now if he's listening he'll say oh this is a lot of hooey but this is what i was told michael had a friend he wanted to write the script so now that guy was going to write the script and i'm not sure they even read my script so i was devastated you know Michael Douglas fired me. I mean, that's <laughs> what. And my wife's, and then to put it all, to make it all worse, I had a 1975 four-cylinder Porsche that I was driving that I purchased for $4,000 in the Stone Age. And somebody left a screwdriver at the back where the engine is when they changed the oil and the screwdriver fell into the fan area and the engine oh. blew apart. So the car was worthless. So I said to my wife, damn, how am I going to find another 1975 <laughs> <laughs> or cylinder Porsche? <laughs> and she looks at me as she's prone to do and says, are you crazy? <laughs> you just wrote a script for Michael Douglas. You have this script money, go and use it to buy a Porsche, <laughs> a, a real one. Yeah. So, but <laughs> I still have it, you know, and think about, think about over all these years, how, how cheap that car was. Oh man. How about a 72 aluminum top? That'd yeah. Be there you go. go. Yeah. I, I, nah, I think I'll stick with what I got. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's see. I'm up. Uh, yeah. Number one, did you ever dress as Rambo for Halloween? No. <laughs> <laughs> quick, quick. but no but it, it, this is embarrassing you know for people magazine people magazine did a uh, piece about me and somehow they convinced me i'm embarrassed to this day i had somehow i came in possession of a huge S rambo standee from a theater mm -hmm. you know, in the lobby yeah it's huge and he's got that you know one of those funny looking weapons you know yeah. whatever it is and they they and i have 
uh, a facsimile of the bow. The bow manufacturer gave me a facsimile of the bow and the arrows mm. from the second movie. So the People magazine and, you know, this is shows you how you can be lured into stupidity. <laughs> there was a little park next to where we lived in Iowa City. And so we went out, dumb me, and we set up <laughs> the standee there in the what was the jungle of Iowa City. Yeah. <laughs> and then they had me with the bow standing next to, you know. Oh, and, no. And so, you know, and that was in People magazine. So that just goes to show you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Here it happens. You know. All right. Number two. What year was Santa Fe founded? You know, I'm I can't give you the precise date, but it's gotta be in the fifteen hundreds. So 1610 is what I read. Well that would wow. make oh okay. Uh, um hmm. It's the oldest capital city in the United States. Right. Now, now I'm embarrassed. Yeah. Uh but you know, the 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 Puritans, you know, the Calvinists hadn't come over to New England yet. And, right. you know, the, 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 this was the city, city was settled here. Well, I'm going to have to have that tattooed on my, on my hand. <laughs> I can't wait to check it. 1610. <laughs> okay. All right. Number three. What do you never, ever put in your salsa? Well, I put nothing in my salsa because I'm allergic to hot spices. So mm. one of the embarrassments of, uh, for you as well as me, if we had a meal together with hot spices, I, I sweat profusely. Oh. And so it isn't going to happen. I'll keep my EpiPen with me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Number four. <clears throat> is it illegal to dance while wearing your sombrero in New Mexico? It is not illegal, no. But they wouldn't. They don't have a sombrero. They might have a stetson. But so no I read sombrero. that it, it actually is illegal in New Mexico. <laughs> what? To dance wearing a sombrero. <laughs> well, that's because they. It, I don't know how to I answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try to square I, that one. Geez. I don't know, but I, that blew my uh, you mind. You guys been drinking? I, I just... <laughs> On this show? Never. I might have been drinking while I read it. So, okay. <laughs> All right. My last question. As a graduate of the National Leadership School, which yes. wilderness skill do you feel you hold the most proficiency in? Oh, do I have a choice? Oh, you're just asking sure. me. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it, the the proficiency and this is one of the things you're trained in is it, when if stuff starts going really badly wrong, you don't lapse into oh my god everything's going to go to hell syndrome, you know that's when you slow things down and this is also a good skill for being a pilot always being ahead of what they call being ahead of the aircraft, um, so you don't want to get behind things you know if if every if if, if you, what you do is you sit for a minute and you know figure it out and then move forward you know make a plan. Uh, these days, that's very strange advice, but, you know, make a plan and uh, <clears throat> figure out, you know, where stuff is going to happen, uh, where right. it's going to lead you. The man's a planner. Yeah. All right. That is me. <clears throat> okay. And there's save one the more. Best, one save more. the best you for have. last. Yes. Not at all. Best for last. Here it is. Um, David, what insect bug or animal sends a chill up your spine? Well, that's interesting. You know, I have a morbid fear about killing uh, insects. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I, I, you know, pick up spiders and take them outside. Uh, I think, you know, the Buddha is in, resides inside me and that I, um, you know, we, uh, we had snakes once get into the house mm. and I went to elaborate lengths to rescue it and take it outside. So yeah. I guess I don't. Wow. Uh, hey. Really? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I have more curiosity than, than anything. And again, this might be one of those things where, you know, I'll say, Oh my God, I forgot to mention, but no, I, I <laughs> silverback, the wombat, the wombat. Uh, the wombat. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. All right. Um, so after Captain America, which uh, you actually did a comic book uh, stint series for a little bit. I did um, six. I did six uh, Captain Americas. It was in a basically a, a graphic novel. Graphic novels, right? Yeah. Who who after him do you think is the greatest American comic book icon? Uh, um, I guess I have to say Captain. Or, uh, um, come on, Batman. Batman. Yeah. Yeah. I, love, love uh, I, I simply because he's so complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Captain America is, is complicated too, but I think Batman's more complicated. You know, it's so Freudian. It's so, you know, mm -hmm. that's a dark, dark 
a place. And so, you know, I, you know, an iconic, you know, I don't know if that's the word to use, but certainly from my perspective, Batman is the most interesting of, of all these characters. And I totally agree with that one. That's a DC, of course, not yep. a Marvel. They'll come after me now. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So my next one, uh, what do you believe is the greatest unsolved mystery of all time? Well, the cure for cancer would be the, you know, yeah. um, um, let's go with that. Wow. Yeah, let's go with that. Um, that, you know, I mean, it's obviously very, uh, very personal to me. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to say that. I yeah. think we're getting closer and closer to finding cures. Uh, for well, you know, as, as, but yeah, specific. This, this is the issue. There's so many, you know, it's all, a, you know, and a lot of it is age related too. you know, as yeah. one gets older. Uh, and, you know, and inevitably the molecular structure begins in, to fall apart and, you know, things happen that, things you know, in a way, out. you know, if, if we, you know, chaos theory, you know, in a way it's a miracle that anything works. Yeah. It really is. It, it all had to uh, be perfectly put together in the beginning of the big bang for all yeah. of this, for all of us to work, including yeah. the human body. And I'm in, I'm in awe of that, you know, I, I uh, and I, 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 uh, I wish, uh, uh that more people would think in a larger way about, you know, how this world or this universe is put together in so amazing a fashion. Right. Uh, so and, it's, and to appreciate it. It seems so perfect. And there's, there have been several, several people who've, um, you know, high thinkers who who think that we live in a simulation. Well, um, yes. What do you think? Yeah. And you, I mean, we go back to, uh, you know, when I was studying with uh, the science fiction writer, Philip Klass, William Ten, um, you know, he he introduced me. To, I only wrote one science fiction story, but you know, there there is a a famous short story in which a man gets smaller and smaller and sinks through various universes. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, um, I wouldn't be uh, yeah. It the story it makes a lot of sense. And Dorothy L. Sayers, the the great mystery writer as well as a, a, a Dante scholar, she wrote a book called The Mind of the Maker in which she uh, reasoned that we were all in a novel that God had created. And this, and that in that way, she was able to rectify uh, free will with omniscience. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's a pretty cool book. The mind of the maker. Feels like that. <clears throat> it's another, another, another thing I've got <laughs> written down. Another book to read. <laughs> um, and so my, my, my last question what do you think actually crashed at Roswell, New Mexico? Oh, probably a weather balloon. Uh, probably what they say. You know, it was so remote there. And, you know, you know how rumors can get started. And, yeah. I mean, honestly, if, if we were going to be visited, unless, you know, surely there would have been more. Surely there, you know, unless it's all invisible. So, uh, you know, in some ways... Uh, uh, I, I just can't, uh, as, as, as much as I enjoy uh, that, that kind of narrative, um, I, I think it was probably pretty prosaic. Well, David, you have, you have, thanks for indulging us in our silliness in this. Uh, <laughs> well, it was fun. <laughs> you know, we, I'm, I'm just, I'm looking up at myself and there's this weird light that's coming off and I look like I'm glowing and I just, so it's I don't shimmer. know. I don't, it's the shimmer. So <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> I, my studio lighting isn't what it should be. It looks good. Uh, no, it looks good. Um, well, we had a, we, there's a new author uh, out named Chris Howdy, who's got a book called Deep State. That's a lot of fun. And he, okay. he, and he had watched a few of our shows, so he came prepared and actually had a question for each of us during the lightning round. Really, uh, really threw us for a loop. So. Wow, that, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so he said if anybody else does that, we have to designate it as the howdy round. So, yeah, so. Well, I, I have to say that you've got this organized very well, and the way it moves around and it's very dynamic and different personalities, and, and you know, it's very different, uh, as, you, as you know, uh, structure that you have for for the show. So I'm, um, you know, I think, I think it works really well. Thank you so much. Well, we appreciate you coming, coming on and, and, uh, we want to, want to toast you and, oh, and here's, yeah. here's to the Western that we're all excited to, to read. Oh, we'll see, you know, I've written it three times now. So, uh, <laughs> you know, what, what's to be done. It took me three years to write first blood. So maybe, 
yeah. maybe Look that's what'll what'll happen now. Yeah, but you know, uh, it's the only thing I can say is that you know if I do this right, people will say, "Well, uh, here's something that's that's so different and new that um, that uh, you know it might it might have a place just on that basis." Well, you've done it before, so that wouldn't be so shocking. Yep. That's for sure. We we follow you across genres, and we're gonna keep oh doing it. Yeah, I, it, it, there I am. The my brand is the genre explorer. <laughs> <laughs> Jean-Luc Picard number two. Yeah. <laughs> right. Can I just say just say once again, I am totally geeked out and fan oh, and crazy you. that David well, Morales on But you look show. like you had fun, you know. Oh I gosh. mean, you know, I mean we had a lot of we talked a lot of, about a lot of substantive things here. We did. And I yeah. think that was really a treat uh, for us for sure. And and the, the truth of the matter is I could think of another two hours of questions. So we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll spare you that. Maybe, maybe someday you can come back on and, and uh, oh, well, no, this especially was when fun. the Western comes out. You know, I got my work done for today. So, you know, uh, uh, if this were in the morning, my day would have been shot, but this, oh. this worked out. Um, but, you know, the John Wayne, the, the, the John Wayne, the Westerns is an ebook for 99 cents. If you want to see, you know, what I have to say about him. Okay. And, um, of course. you know, there's a, uh, you know, we'll see. Good luck to all of you. You know, we we live in a a, a time when publishing is approaching a. Um, the, I I've never seen anything like it. There are now, two hundred and seventy one streaming services, and there are five hundred and thirty two scripted television series. Unbelievable. And and I have uh, my, in my mission, <clears throat> I go around and I when I talk to people at you know, here and there, I say, what are you reading? And they say, I'm too busy. And I say, what are they too busy? And they're too busy binge watching television. And, you know, and so I'm just pushing it. I'm just embarrassing people. You know, like if you don't put words in your head, you're going to, you're not going to do too well. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and we're at, at a crisis. What I'm hoping is that people will recognize that all these shows are starting to look the same. Oh, yeah. And yeah. and that the freshness that was there isn't there anymore, with exceptions, mm -hmm. you know, obviously. Um, and that uh, a lot of these mm -hmm. companies are in a balloon that's going to burst and there's going to be some financial fallout here. And it may be we'll go back, you know, to, to where things were reasonable. Um, but you know what I, you know, anything we can do to promote reading, I'm giving a talk on Thursday to the local Rotary club and they give money to the libraries after school reading program. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm going to tell them what I just said to you about, you know, that I think we're heading in a, toward a crisis mode where, mm -hmm. and uh, people are, uh, 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 the Nielsen Corporation, the Media Research Corporation, estimates that we are on our devices, I don't know about you and I, but people, 11 and a half hours a day. Oof. And yeah, I don't think that, that's, it's not sustainable. It's, it's not sustainable. And it, well, they're, they're doing it at work. They're doing it wherever. They're doing it while they eat. They're doing it when they talk to people. And, and we hope that they're reading ebooks, but I rather doubt it. And, yeah. and I'm sensing, I hope I'm wrong, I'm sensing that publishers are starting to get a little, they're not admitting it, but I think they're, you know, getting a little confused. Hmm. Um, and, you know, our, our, our job is to promote ideas and excitement of reading. Right. Uh, and learning, uh, because they're certainly not going to have excitement of ideas and learning on most of these television shows. Right. And I say that as somebody whose life was changed by a television show. But, you know, that was at another time. Yeah. Well, there's a balance to it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So. We, my wife and I, there's nobody here. So, you know, my wife and I, we prepare a meal and we watch a movie. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then the movie's done and we go off and read. Yep. Or we watch, you know, a couple episodes of the television show. Uh, if there's something that, you know, I'm interested to see what happened with uh, The Outsider on HBO with the Stephen King adaptation. Mm. Uh, we'll see, you know, how that turns out. Um, but, you know, uh, everything in proportion. And, uh, and when I was growing up, somebody said to me, you put words out of your head all day long. At night, you have to put words back in. Mm. And, you know, so I, you know, you know, more power to all you guys to let's just you know keep at it right exactly. we're, on, we're on a heroic quest here so so they my greatest collection is not my uh 
DVD collection or my movie yeah. collection, it's behind me in these bookshelves. Yeah, exactly. Right. And those are my treasured, my treasured things. Yeah, yeah. Right. <clears throat> cool. Sure. Very cool. Well, yeah. thank you very much. Thanks once again okay. for all the time you gave us and for thank all you, you do for the craft and the other writers out there. Um, again, we would we would not even know each other if it wasn't for Thriller Fest. And that was... It's true. Of, and that, of, you know, for what I said earlier about, you know, I think the branding has gone too far. Mm -hmm. But the rest of it and the camaraderie and the ability for people just to hang out in corridors and compare ideas, that's, that's priceless. Absolutely. And you know what else Truly. about it is the accountability. Like, we, we're always asking each other, you know, how much did you write today? How much did you get done? Yeah. Um, it, not, not that we're, you know, demanding 2000 words a day from each other, but just to make sure that we're all stay on task and, and remember what our, you know, what we've set out to do. Yes. Well, Sterling wrote five pages a day. So, you know, that's, that's always been, you know, if he could do it, I could do it. Hmm. Might not always be good pages, alas. <laughs> but they're there. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for the example. Oh, David, you're quite we welcome. It. And that's a nice, uh, you know, nice spending this time. So, uh, uh, good evening to all of you. Hey, you, you tell your well. wife she can come in. Okay, is my wife there? <laughs> okay. She's all hungry. Right, thanks very much, David. Uh, Thank she, you, David. Okay. Thank you, David. Bye. Thank you so much. Take care. <laughs>This is the outro for David Morrell. Three, two, one. Whoa, your microphone just blew up again. Oh, that's so hot. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> Rewind. Even the computer doesn't want you to do it the first time. <laughs> oh, man. Come on. Two hours mm -hmm. and 20 minutes. We need, we need, we need bloopers, lots of them. We need, we need context. <clears throat> Here we go. Outro number two. And good. Thank you, Mr. Morrell. Can't wait to read your Western. For those of you who are catching us, should have... you got it. Like and comment on our Twitter page, and you just might win a signed copy of some damn book. <laughs> I don't know why I went that route. I guess. <laughs> oh, you were there. You were so I know. Close. I don't know why I started talking. I was like, why am I your line? Yeah. I All right. love this. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to keep it shorter. Sorry, Chris. <clears throat> <laughs> I want to thank. All right, let me laugh. <laughs> uh -oh. I'm looking at Chris. Sorry. Minimize him. Okay, go. I want to want to get. Hang on. <laughs> what do you right, do? Do 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 do. Well, no, that's not quite what we want to finish on. <laughs>